So this is a training video that I have uh, wanted to or needed to really uh, put together for quite some time now and it seems like all of the training videos that I put up on the YouTube channel um, are trade specific or strategy specific and then of course they all come with the disclaimer and the tagline hey no matter how good any one strategy is you never want to put more than 10 percent of your total overall portfolio into any one approach and the question then obviously begs itself is, uh, well, where do we put the other 90%, right? Where does the rest of our money go? And uh, what do we do with the rest of our uh, account funds? And so this is more of a holistic approach. This is a 30,000 foot view, if you will. This is a sort of top down approach to looking at managing your overall portfolio. And uh, rather than doing it how we usually do, which was we look from the bottom up, we look at the specific strategy and then try to see how that fits into the overall picture. We reverse this and look at it from the top down. So it is a holistic uh, view of our overall portfolio. And the real, I guess, starting point in this is the topic of diversification. There's probably no word that is used more frequently in investing than diversification and there's probably no word that is more misused or at least misunderstood because diversification is not what you think um, if you talk to I have a 16 year old son <clears throat> that is investing now and if you talk to him he knows the word diversification everybody has heard the word everybody thinks they understand the word diversification but they don't use it properly in terms of implementation and so you talk to people and ask them if they're an investor and they are diversified and they will say things like well yeah I'm diversified I have you know my stock over 15 spread over 15 or 20 different stocks or I have seven or eight different mutual funds that I or I have different accounts I have a 401k account I have an IRA account I have a Roth account and they feel that that is diversification and I always ask them what would happen to all of those accounts simultaneously if the Dow was going to drop a thousand points in one day which it does from time to time and of course the answer is that all of those accounts, the plethora of accounts that you have spread across who knows how many different brokerage accounts or different uh, account numbers are all going to go down. They're all going to move in the same direction. So in fact, diversification is really just spreading your money around. Uh, and that doesn't really serve any purpose other than just to clutter your ability to keep track of what it is that you have going on. So really, we need to get we need to do away with the, the word diversification and we need to talk a little bit more about asset allocation and and when we asset allocate we are looking to invest our money in different asset classes and generally speaking what we're looking for out of that asset allocation is non-correlated asset classes now non-correlated assets what what does that mean well, it simply means that when one thing is going up, something else is going down. And we've seen this uh, so often in our portfolios, and it has to do with what we call the equity curve. So the equity curve is basically what is happening at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, the end of the year with your overall portfolio value. So if you have $100,000 spread around amongst 10 different accounts, this isn't looking at individual trades. This isn't even looking at individual accounts. This is looking at your overall results. So maybe you do have five different accounts that you are invested in. And on any given day, you, you may have one that is way down, one that is maybe slightly down, one that's just kind of flat on the day, one that's maybe way up on the day, one that's maybe slightly up on the day. But every single day, you're going to have stuff that is showing losses. You're going to have stuff that's showing gains. And you kind of get this. When you look at it very myopically, it uh, just seems like a lot of noise and chaos. But the reality is that over time, your account values, your equity curve, if you will, should look something like this. We analogize that to a set of stairs. Uh, right, you're going to have these fits and starts, these fits and starts, these fits and starts as you walk upstairs. But over time, you don't see these lows and you don't even really see these highs. You just see the direction that the account is moving. And so, non correlated assets again is the idea that we can get something in place that offsets the risk of something else. That's the idea of non correlated assets. So what I want to do here in this video is that I want to go through 
and I want to give you about 15 asset classes to get you started. This is absolutely not a definitive list by any stretch of the imagination, but these are the 15 major asset classes or uh, approaches or strategies that I look to when building an overall portfolio. Uh, again, the idea is we don't want to put more than 10% in any one, even, one given strategy. So you got to have a plethora of options to choose from to be able to get fully invested. So let's go ahead and look at some of these. The first one obviously is equity exposure. Now that's a very broad uh, phrase, equity exposure, but we do want to just have some exposure to the stock market. Now guys, I think it was Albert Einstein that said that we as human beings, we tend to over purposely overcomplicate things of great import. Uh, if something is very important to us, it must therefore be complicated, right? And that does not have to be the case. Now, obviously, beyond your relationship with your God, your family and friends and your health, money is one of the most important things that we have in our life. And so it is important. It must be complicated. And we try to overcomplicate it. Guys, it doesn't need to be complicated. One ticker symbol one ticker symbol, whether you have a thousand dollars or a million dollars, can get you into the stock market on a diversified basis. Remember I said the word diversification because it doesn't give you asset allocation, it gives you diversification, right? That's the S&P 500 ETF. It'll diversify your money amongst 500 of the largest well-known blue chip companies. And you can do it with one ticker symbol, right? So you don't need to get crazy when you talk about, I'm invested in the marketplace. You don't need to go pick 15 or 20 stocks. Guys, on any given day, if you count ETFs, exchange traded funds, there are over 14,000 underlines that trade on the US stock exchanges day in and day out. How many stocks do you own? Of the 14,000, how many do you have? Do you have four, do you have five? Do you have 10? Do you have 20? It, it doesn't matter how many you have. Do you understand the arrogance? Do you understand the pride that we exhibit when we buy a individual stock? It's essentially us saying, well, listen, uh, obviously I think this is a good investment, right? I wouldn't put my hard earned money into anything that I did not think was amazing. And if I thought that there was something better, of course, I would have chosen it instead, right? So we have basically just said, listen, I've gone through all 14,000 underlines out there. I have found the best. I know what the needle in the haystack is going to be, right? When of course we don't, we really never do. And so it's probably just better if we are looking for equity exposure to do it with one simple ticker symbol and that's the SPY. Now, we don't just do it with a simple buy and hold approach. We use the wheel strategy. And the wheel strategy is where step one, we sell a put. So we don't need to, and I'm not going to in this video get into strategy specifics. Uh, you can look those up on your own. But the wheel strategy is simply is a several fold approach to A, buying something at a discount. So maybe the SPY is trading for $100 a share. We say, that's fine, I want to buy it, I want to own it, but I don't want to pay $100 a share, I want to buy it at a discount. Maybe I want to buy it at 95, so we can sell a put that obligates us to buy that at 95. If the stock comes down, if the SPY comes down, touches 95, we get triggered in, we now own it at 95 instead of the 100 that we would have purchased it at before. Plus we keep the income, we keep the premium that we brought in by selling that put. If it doesn't hit 95, we just keep that money that we brought in by selling that put and we do it again. If it does come down and it hits that 95 level and it now triggers us in, step two now, we own it, right? We are the owner of that SPY at $95 a share. So step three now, we turn around and we sell calls. We sell covered calls against it. We now start to generate uh, an income off of that share or shares of the SPY. So that's step one there. That's an easy, fast, simple, clean, low commission, high alpha way to gain equity exposure in the marketplace. Guys, it doesn't need to get more complicated than that. You don't need 27 things in your equity exposure 
strategy, or approach. The next asset category that we could look at uh, to create some non-correlated asset allocation is precious metals. I think that there's uh, that we don't need to spend a lot of time here in this educational video talking about the merits of having some of your account value placed in precious metals, even if that is, uh, as I generally believe, something that shouldn't maybe uh, approach more than one or two percent of your overall asset allocation. But there is a lot of merit in having precious metals in your investment account. Uh, one of my uh, cohorts, one of the individuals that I work with very closely in the investing world is Jim Rickards. Jim's written a bunch of books on the intrinsic value of gold and silver or precious metals in general. Now, there are some issues with uh, gold and silver. One of them is that they, much like raw land, do not cash flow, right? There is no cash flow. There's no dividend payment on gold or silver. Uh, there's no interest payment made on gold or silver. And so it's nice to be able to own things that not only have the potential for appreciation, in this case, not only work as a hedge against so many things that are happening in the economy and the world today, but that they also generate an income while we hold on to those. And so there's a couple of components here to investing in precious metals. Number one is the ticker symbols. You can use ticker symbol GLD. That's the ETF for gold. And you can use the ticker symbol SLV. That's the ticker symbol for silver. So it can be very simple to do this. But we are going to choose one or the other. It is an either or, either or type scenario. And it is based on the gold silver ratio. Okay. What is the gold silver ratio? Well, there's a lot of places that you can get the gold silver ratio. In fact, they're all over the internet. But I do like goldsilver.com's website for this. I think it's done in a, a clean uh, layout, a clean manner. Uh, and I'll just read right from their website. The gold silver ratio, or the GSR, as a lot of times it's referred to, is just simply. Whatever the current price of an ounce of gold is divided by the current price of an ounce of silver. So it's just a numerical calculation that, that gives us a multiple of how much gold is trading relative to the price of silver. Now, this is a common indicator that we use in precious metals to figure out undervaluation and overvaluation. Right here it says that the, the gold-silver ratio is simple. Take the price of an ounce of gold divided by the price of the ounce of a silver, and you've got the ratio. Now, this ratio does work at its best when the ratio is at extremes. So when the ratio tops 80, it signals a time when silver was inexpensive relative to gold. Okay? Silver's gone on to rally 40%, or 40%, 300%, in the last three times that that has happened. Likewise. Uh, the three times that gold or the silver ratio has fallen below 20 marks a period when gold was relatively inexpensive compared to silver, right? So again, it's the 80-20 lines that we're looking at on here. When it tops 80, it is meaning that silver is uh, relatively inexpensive to gold. Where are we at today? Well, we're at about 77. So silver would probably be, be the better buy right now than gold. How are we going to implement that ratio or that math? Well, once again, folks, with regards to precious metals, we're going to use the wheel implementation. We're going to use the wheel where we, number one, sell a put. We're, if we're looking at silver here, we're going to sell a put on silver. We're going to own it. We're going to purchase it at that discounted price. Number three, we're going to cash flow it. And we cash flow it by selling calls. So now you have the best of both worlds. We're purchasing these at a discounted price. We're cash flowing them. We're generating an income. And we have precious metals, which come with all of the accoutrements that we get in regards to what pressure, precious metals do in uncertain economic times. All right, what's another asset class that we could use to develop a non-correlated uh, holistic portfolio? Well, one of the ones that is my favorite is oil. 
Uh, oil is a really interesting, amazing thing to invest in. If you think of so many of the challenges that we have with investing in equities as an underlying asset, and so many of those issues that we face are gone. They don't exist with oil. Number one, first and foremost, guys, oil cannot and will not go to zero in terms of its valuation. Oil will not go bankrupt. Now, before anybody says, aha, I remember not too long ago that oil actually went negative. It actually had a negative value. Oil never had a negative value, folks. That was the futures contracts on oil. And it was an interesting situation where every oil tanker, every facility, you guys understand that the refineries don't take days off, right? They pump oil 24 7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Oil keeps pumping. And uh, every storage facility in the entire world, in to, in, in, including shipping tankers, the oil tankers that are out floating on the seas, every single one of them was full. And there was no place to store the production crude. And so if you don't have a place to store your oil, you have to start offering people money now to store your oil for you. And if they don't want to store it, what do you do? Well, you got to keep increasing the price. And so that's what happened with the futures market. It did go negative, but oil itself did never did not go negative. It can't go negative. It's never going to go bankrupt. It's also very, very independent or almost inversely related to so much that happens in the equity world. Oil is an awesome commodity. Commodities are something that we should have as a non-correlated asset class. And oil is one of the granddaddies of all of those commodities. Now, the easiest way to invest in oil, again, use the ETF, the Exchange Traded Fund, which has a ticker symbol USO. Very straightforward, very easy to do. However, I will tell you that my favorite way to invest in oil, my favorite way to use oil is with the futures contracts. Now it's the ticker symbol forward slash CL is the ticker symbol for that. And the way that I trade that is every Wednesday. Every Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, oil inventory numbers are reported. And that usually generates quite a bit of not only activity in the futures contracts, it also creates a lot of leverage. And there's a whole entire system that we have. If you want to hit me up on that, I can get you some more information on that. There's a whole entire process to trade pullbacks, what are called pullbacks on bullish or bearish moves off of that Wednesday inventory number. But oil is an important thing to have as a non-correlated asset class. Another category that is very important, not only from a diversification standpoint of spreading our money around, but from a non-correlated asset standpoint, is real estate. Now, everything today, folks, and it's going to be very apparent here uh, as I move forward with some of these other categories, you'll see this, everything, and I mean everything today, can be basically liquefied. It can be... Uh, put into the stock market and traded. And real estate is one of those items. It has been uh, securitized and listed on stock exchanges. And the easiest way to invest in real estate in the stock market is with REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. These by law have to distribute 90% 90, 90 of all of their income. They have good growth potential. They have nice dividends. One of my long-term buy and hold REITs that I bought in the early 90s, I've never sold and I probably never will, is a ticker symbol O, ticker symbol O, and that is a real estate investment trust. Now, when I bought this in the early 90s, the dividend was about 5.8%, which at the time was pretty good, but I've held on to those shares, and today, that with dividend increases on my original share price, that's the that's the key on my original investment price. Uh, that dividend right now for me is paying around forty seven percent a year APR. I make almost fifty percent a year guaranteed just on the dividend payment, uh, above and beyond any type of appreciation that I might get. So real estate investment trust, good way to invest in real estate. You can use that as a security to 
add to your diversification in your overall portfolio. If you time that or color that with selling covered calls against those, and of course the key here is that you need to make sure that the REIT that you are looking at has option ability. Not all real estate investment trusts are optionable. Okay, So you need to make sure that it is optionable so that you can sell covered calls against it. Now you could effectively double whatever the dividend on that is with investment income. But the other thing that's interesting, and this is not so new anymore. It was a, 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 a new phase maybe 10 years ago. It's become more and more well known now. It really is the securitization of real estate and the crowdfunding of real estate. It is this ability, this idea to turn real estate into mutual funds. Most of you are familiar with what a mutual fund is. When the mutual funds came out in the, in the late 60s or early 70s, the idea was very interesting. Prior to that, if you wanted to invest in the stock market, you had to buy shares of stock and you usually had to buy them in quantities of 100. So in other words, you had to have a lot of money to be able to get into the stock market. It was a rich man's game. Well, someone came along with this great idea of a mutual fund where they said, listen, if you don't have enough money to invest in 100 shares of a given stock, give me your money. Give me your $50. Give me your $100. Give me your $200. And we'll pool that with thousands of other investors and we will put your money into this mutual fund company. And the mutual fund company will then go out and buy shares in dozens and dozens and dozens of company stock. So with $50, $100, you could have your money diversified across dozens of different companies' stocks. And that idea was wonderful, right? That same principle today is happening as we speak in real estate with the securitization and crowdfunding aspect of real estate. Two of the companies that I've used in the past and that I do like, and again, guys, my disclaimer here, in any of these, I'm not making any specific company recommendations. I'm not making any specific product recommendations. These are just past experiences that I have had that have been uh, a positive experience for me. But one is Fundrise and the other is Realty Mogul. Let me show you what those look like. Fundrise is an example and the epitome of crowdsourcing real estate deals. So you can look at all different kinds of deals. You can start investing in something like a Fundrise company. And again, I'm not specifically recommending Fundrise. This is just one that I've had experience with in the past. Uh, but you can start with $1,000, folks. And with $1,000, you can start investing in something as small as a single family rental home in Los Angeles with a projected return of 5.8% to 12.7%, which is equity, where you're taking an ownership position in that all the way up to where you are lending your thousand dollars. You're lending your money on a new apartment development in Atlanta, Georgia with a projected interest rate of 8%. But there's all kinds of deals that you can pick and choose from. If you look at their past performance, you can see what they generated over the years going back to uh, 2014 and going forward here to this past year. That's real estate investing, guys, but it's done on a passive basis. Think about this for a minute. How nice would it be to own rental properties? How nice would it be to have a stake in these apartment complexes right here, in this apartment development that's brand new right here, in a commercial endeavor, just something like right here, and never, ever have to talk to a tenant, never have to deal with maintenance, never have to collect a rent check, you just get your dividends sent to wherever you tell them to send them. So I love these crowdsourcing real estate sources like Fundrise. I also like Realty Mogul and I've invested uh, in quite a few deals over the years with Realty Mogul. This was the very first deal right here that I ever did with real estate on a crowdfunded basis. I did it back in August of 2013 uh, this was a 267 unit apartment complex that I did here, put in $5,000 total investment, received $8,200 back, and we closed and, and sold that property on 10-2016. These are interesting ideas, guys. These are interesting projects here that you can use 
to play with the big boys. You can invest in uh, commercial projects. You can invest in high rises. You can invest in apartment buildings with as little as $1,000. So real estate has never, guys, been easier to add to your overall asset allocation. Another aspect that's important to have in a non-correlated uh, holistic portfolio beyond real estate is bonds. And you've always heard of bonds. The problem, of course, with bonds, folks, there is this uh, teeter-totter effect that we get with bonds, right? As interest rates, as the interest rates on bonds drop, the value of those bonds increase. Well, where are we at today in today's world with regards to interest rates? Well, we're at rock bottom levels. So in other words, guys, there may never be a worse time to invest in bonds because interest rates only really have effectively one way to go, right? They can't go any lower. They're almost at zero now. And as your interest rates rise, these values are going to fall and we're going to start losing money on bonds. Bonds have just as much ability to crash as stocks do. So how do we overcome this? Because bonds are such an important aspect to our portfolio to get that non-correlation, right? Well, we can use things like the ticker symbol HYG. This is high yield bonds. These are more adept at correlating with what's happening in the marketplace and adjusting for interest rates. They're not based off of treasury rates. And if we add covered calls into those now, we now have the ability to generate a substantial rate of return versus just buying any bond today that might very well pay us no more than 2 or 3% a year. So bonds are an important aspect to add to a non-diversified, or excuse me, a non-correlated asset class of investments. One of the more interesting strategies, or one of the more interesting classifications, is the volatility sector of the marketplace. As you guys all know, there is volatility in the marketplace. That volatility is measurable. And not only is it measurable, but it is tradable, okay? You can trade volatility in the marketplace. Now, there are all kinds, there's all kinds of ticker symbols that you can use to go trade volatility. And I'm not gonna get into all of those here in this primer, but I will tell you that we use this for a couple of purposes. We use the volatility indexes, number one, as a buy sell indicator okay this volatility can tell us when we should be buying in the marketplace and when we should be selling in the marketplace there is a saying in the marketplace that has to do with the vix or the volatility index and the saying is when the vix is high it's time to buy and when the vix is low it's time to go. Let's take a look at what that actually means. So this is a chart that was taken out of a little snippet of time here from 2010 through 2012, which happened to be a period of decent volatility in the marketplace. And up top here, you see the VIX. That's the volatility index. And down here below, you see the SPX, which is the S&P 500. And again, the idea is when the VIX is high, it's time to buy. When the VIX is low, it's time to go. Now, this is sort of an inverse relationship, right? Think about that for just a second. When everything is peachy keen, when everything is hunky-dory and rosy and everybody is just making money left and right and the market's doing nothing but going up, 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 complacency is high and fear or volatility is low, right? Conversely, when uh, the market is crashing every single day. People are losing thousands and thousands of dollars. People are jumping out of windows. When that kind of scenario takes place, volatility is high. Fear is high. And as a Baron Rothschild is famously quoted as saying, you want to buy when blood runs in the streets. When everybody in your dog is piling into the stock market and complacency is high, that's the time to head for the exits. After the market has crashed 
and everybody says, oh my gosh, the last thing I, I would put my money in the mattress before I ever put money in the stock market again, that's the time to invest. And you can see that correlation right here. That saying, when the VIX is high, it's time to buy. When the VIX is low, it's time to go. When the VIX surges above 40, fear is out of this world. And that tells us that, A, the market's probably been crashing, and that's now a good time to start building positions. Okay. Conversely, when the VIX is below 15, that's when we have a high level of, com of uh, complacency, probably time to start taking some of your profits off the table. Right. Again, when the VIX is high, it's time to start buying. When the VIX is low, it's time to start selling. So that is the VIX or the volatility index. So the VIX can act as a buy sell indicator. It can ca act as a counter trend opportunity as well, folks. When the VIX is high, that can be a nice time to short it. When the VIX is low, it can be a nice time to buy it. So the VIX is a nice place to look for investing opportunities. Okay, now next up is one of my very, very all-time favorite investment classes ever. <laughs> have, I, have, I, have I oversold that enough? This is probably without a doubt my favorite place to put money. Now, remember guys, I'm giving you 15 asset classes here. We've said that we don't want to really put more than 10% of our overall portfolio in any one asset class. I've given you 15 here and I could give you another five off the top of my head if push came to shove. So when I talk about putting our money in one of these asset classes, because it doesn't have to be a lot of our portfolio. It could be 1% of our overall portfolio in any one of these areas. This is an area that I don't have a lot of my net worth in, but it is my favorite, favorite place to make investments. And that has to do with collectibles, the collectibles market. Uh, this is an amazing place to find interesting opportunities. And the blessed place that I know, guys, and again, this is no uh, recommendation on my part. There's no compensation on my part. This is just, again, me showing you what I use it's Rally Road. Rally Road is one of the coolest places ever to go find collectible investment opportunities. Let me show you some of the things that they have. I'll just pop right here inside my account. I can show you what these guys have available. They have cars. They have memorabilia. They have watches. They have literature and comics. And they have fine wine and whiskey. Let me tell you some of the things that I have invested in here inside of Rally Road. I have a Ted Williams baseball. I have a Honus Wagner card. I don't know how many of those there are in the world, but I think there's only a handful of Honus Wagners out there. I have a share in one. I have a Winston Churchill signed first edition Second World War book. I have a bunch of Birkin bags. If you know what those are, uh, or if you don't know what those are, uh, talk to your spouse, talk to your wife. She will let you know. I have a Babe Ruth baseball bat. I have a Ty Cobb card. I have a Mickey Mantle card. I have shares in a Maserati, a Lamborghini, a Porsche, a Mustang, a Jaguar E-Type, and uh, this car right here. Well, where did it go? A Ford GT. I thought I saw a Ford GT on here. There's all kinds of luxury watches that are incredibly rare. Hermes bags that you can invest in. All types of amazing literature. Signed George Orwell books, uh, JFK books signed by him. A 42 DC Comics on Superman. That went fast. All of these things, guys, are amazing investment opportunities. And you can start with a couple hundred dollars. And yes, these are tradable. After 90 days of investing in a share of this, you can resell your shares. You can offer them to the marketplace. So this is an interesting way, guys. Uh, if we take a look at uh, a car here, let's take a look at a car. I, I'm a car guy. So we've got a, a 95 Ferrari F355 coming up for auction here. That car is going to be auctioned off for $120,000. Guess what? If you got 200 bucks, you can probably get involved in that auction. You can probably buy a share or a stake in that car. There's the car right there. There's my car right there. 
You want to own a Ford GT? And guys, who doesn't want to own a Ford GT? Come on. It's a $325,000 car. Guys, I'm telling you, this car will be a $500,000 car in the next 10 years. It absolutely will be a $500 car. There is such limited demand, uh, or excuse me, overwhelming demand and limited supply for this. These cars are absolutely, that was a $200,000 car when it was new. And it's absolutely skyrocketing now in the aftermarket. You can get into it with just $100 or so, $200. So this is an interesting area here, guys, collectible. Here's another area that I, I have a lot of interest in, and it's been an interesting area to watch this area expand and grow over the last 10 years, and that is peer-to-peer -peer lending, or P2P lending, as it is most often referred to. So let's just talk about the concept here of peer-to-peer -peer lending for just a second. You guys know that banks are corporations, and most of them are publicly traded. The money center banks, those that trade that uh, on Wall Street that most of us know, the Citigroups, the Bank of Americas, the Wells Fargo's, the Chase, etc., those types of banks, we all understand that they are for-profit institutions. And if you look at an annual report on any of those companies, you'll see that their bottom lines are incredibly, incredibly healthy. How do they get so healthy uh, when they are charging, uh, you know, just a few percentage points for loans today? Well, where does the money come from that a bank lends you? Isn't it just a return of your own money? All they're doing is taking your deposits, right? They line up a teller on window A and they take your money in. They take it in the form of a savings account or a checking account and they give you 1% on your money if you're lucky. And then they turn that same money around on window B and they lend it out to you at four, five, six, seven, eight percent. And of course, they keep the difference. Now, their money cost is zero. And so their return on that money is infinite before they factor in their gross overhead cost. Banks are profitable, right? Well, along came a new fangled approach to lending called credit unions. And the concept, if you understand it, is pretty darn cool. The concept of the credit union is there are no share, uh, there are no corporate owners of this. It is not technically a for-profit institution. You'll notice when you look at your deposit slips, if you are a member of a credit union, that that in fact is what they call you. They call you a member. You're not a customer. You are a member, and that means that you are a part owner of that uh, corporation. And so. How do they function? How do they work if they are nonprofit? Well, that simply means that they have to give all of their profits back to you as a member, as an owner. There's only two ways that a credit union can give you money back so that at the end of the year they balance out their books and they don't have excess profits. Number one is they can lower the rates that they charge you on your loans. If they lower the rates, they make less profit, right? Number two is they can raise the rates that they pay you on your savings and checking. And if they raise the rates that they pay out, that of course lowers their profit also. And so you'll notice that they move those numbers around to try to get to that zero number at the end of each year. The idea with a credit union is, hey, let's remove the middleman. Let's take out these greedy Wall Street shareholders that need a corporation to make profits and let's just go direct. Well, that's what peer-to-peer -peer lending is. It's even a more pure uh, version of what the credit unions have tried to do. It's basically saying, listen, Joe, I come to you and I say, hey, I know you have money and I don't. You know me. I need a roof on my house and that roof's going to cost me $7,000. I don't have it. And you say, all right, Scott, listen, I will lend you the $7,000 and I will charge you interest. So that's the essence of peer-to-peer -peer lending, guys. It is individuals lending other individuals money. Now, a company that I've been using for a very long time, again, this goes way, way back to maybe, oh, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there when I started with peer-to-peer -peer lending is a company called Prosper. And again, I'm not recommending them necessarily. I'm just showing you who I use or have used in the past. But I want to show you some information on a company like Prosper. This particular example right here happens to be one of my wife's IRAs. But if you look at this, you can see that um, we have invested in different asset classes. So you can pick what the credit worthiness of an individual is. 
You can look at C class, D class, E class, double A's if you want to. All of those things are reflected in the interest rates that they are going to pay. These are obviously paying interest rates over and over again. And if you look at the history here, you can see this is all set on auto invest. There is nothing for us to do. The auto invest amount that we have set is when I hit a cash balance of $35, go ahead and invest that money. So almost every single day, we've got interest coming in. We're putting $35 on another loan. You can take a look at those information on the loans individually if you want to and see what it is that happens inside of each one of those loans. But it's a great way, guys, be, to invest money that over time we have never had a single down year. Going back again to maybe the 2008, 2009 period, we've never had a single down year on our interest that we earn. Yes, there are charge offs. Yes, there are write offs. Uh, when you invest in these, just like a bank would have, right? A bank is going to have charge-offs and write-offs. We're going to have those as well. Uh, but that's part of the process here. You can see that our current loans, we have 2,163 loans out, spread out over that $54,000. Of the 2,100 loans that we have, 39 are currently delinquent 30 days. 51 are delinquent more than 30 days. So it is just like a bank, guys. You get write-offs in this. This is why our interest rate on a lot of these loans is 18, 19%, but our net uh, rate of return is around 6%. It's because it takes into account all of those write-offs. This is not stock market correlated, guys. The stock market can go up, it can go down, it can crash. We can go through recessions. I've been through two recessions now with this. Been through what happened in the 2008 financial collapse. I've been through the pandemic and what has happened with job losses there. I've seen this battle tested. I know what the default rates are going to be on these, and they're no different really than any bank has. And yet every single year, the profits just trickle in, and there's no action that's really needed on our part. It is a complete autopilot system. Okay. What else is out there that we could invest in? Guys, I'll tell you one of my favorites to trade, and this is a little controversial for a lot of people, but it is the cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. Now, I am not a cryptocurrency, and I am certainly not a blockchain technology expert. What I do know is that it moves, and as a trader more than an investor, that's all I ever really look for is movement, something that moves. Cryptocurrencies, and again, specifically Bitcoin, they move, okay? So I opened an account years ago. I did not catch the first wave. I was a late adopter, as they say. Uh, but I, I opened an, a, 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 an account with Coinbase uh, with about $1,000, and I have slowly traded in and out of Bitcoin. It goes up, I sell it, it goes down, I buy it, it goes up, I sell it. I got about $3,600, $3,700 or something like that in my Bitcoin account right now. And guys, it moves. It moves. So again, it's just prudent to be able to have these opportunities to be able to take advantage of them uh, when you can and you need to be prepared for those. Cryptocurrencies is certainly one of those that is uh, something to look at, regardless of your feelings about whether or not it is a viable currency or not. Okay, another one that is a, a fun one for me, and I have to confess that... I, I am not I am not a, uh, a, a, a masterworks. I, I go to the Louvre. I've gone to the Louvre in Paris. I've been there. I've seen uh, uh, the, the, the statues of David. I've seen the Sistine Chapel. I've seen the Mona Lisa. I know the difference between a Rembrandt uh, and a Matisse. I understand some of those things, but I am not an art specialist by any stretch of the imagination. But Masterwork I.O. is a place to invest in works of art. And again, it's done on a securitized basis with crowdfunding with fractional shares. So you can invest in portraits that you would never think you could ever own on your own on a fractional basis. Let's just take a look at it real quick. So Masterworks does, uh, in my opinion, a really good job of researching these works of art, these master painters, if you will. And they look at how these uh, pieces of work have performed, how they have appreciated over time 
with their similar works, other works that these artists might have put out. This particular one, I, I have no idea who Joan Mitchell was. She obviously was pretty uh, impressive, leading abstract expressionist of her generation. This painting right here is appraised at $5.5 million. They're selling it for $5 million. Guys, you can get in with a $500 investment. There's an Andy Warhol right there. That's somebody that I'm a little bit more familiar with, okay? His works have historically appreciated at about 17.5% a year. And again, this is a $3.8 million appraisal that you can get in for a $500 investment, okay? I do have some of these that you can see from some of the closed deals here in the past. Uh, I went with names that I knew. I have a bank, banks, Banksy. I have one Banksy uh, investment. I do have a Monet. I'm familiar with who Claude Monet was. And I do have an Andy Warhol investment. Um, all of these things, again, are securitized. They are liquefied. They are tradable. You can get in and out of them. You can sell them. Uh, and they give you the ability, guys, to invest in something that is a four and a half million dollar investment that has performed quite well over time and do it with a very, very small investment amount. Okay, what other asset classes can we look at? Well, one that should be on everybody's list that has a portfolio of any size is the ability to hedge. And we hedge using the futures market. Now, so many people say, oh, futures. I mean, isn't that complicated? Isn't that uh, complex and difficult to understand? Isn't that incredibly sophisticated? I just, I'm used to just buying mutual funds and ETFs. I wouldn't have any idea where to start with futures. Guys, futures does not need to be complicated. We certainly can complicate it, but it does not need to be complicated. And the reason that it's important to have access to trading futures in your account, 82% going back over the last two decades. Let me repeat this. Going back over 20 years, 82% of the big, massive shock waves to the marketplace happened before or after the market was closed. Think about how many times just in recent history you have seen some news article comes out before or after the market is closed and when the market opens up that next time it goes lock limit down or it goes lock limit up. There's no way to really take advantage of those opportunities. There's no way to protect yourselves either. If you have a portfolio of a million dollars and it's spread out over 30 different stocks and 20 different ETFs and different mutual funds, guys, there's no practical way to close those positions out if you see a market collapse happening. That's something that's almost instantaneous in many, many cases. But you do have the time to push one single button and buy or short in that case, short the S&P 500. That would be the ticker symbol forward slash ES. Or the NASDAQ, ticker symbol is forward slash NQ. So you need to have the ability, folks, to hedge your accounts. It just makes sense. It's just a prudent thing to have. In addition to hedging, in addition to uh, the futures market, options. Options are obviously a huge component to my trading approach. They make up the majority of my strategies. Now, again, remember we're talking about asset allocation, spreading our money uh, around so that we don't have any more than 10% in any one given strategy. So let me make a distinction here uh, between categories, a category that we might be putting our money in, and a strategy. Okay, uh, A strategy and a category, two very different things. Inside of a category, that might be options. Options is a category, right? But as far as strategy goes, uh, strategies, there might be uh, 10. There might be 12 different strategies that we employ. The strategy that I like the most with option trading is this idea or this concept of trading ranges rather than direction, okay? 
most trades are very binary in nature. Most people only know buy low, sell high. That's all we know, right? We want to buy it low. Hopefully, we want to sell it high. Now, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you understand about this concept of shorting stocks. And shorting stocks is where we can make money if stuff goes down. That's where we sell high and we buy it back when it's low, right? And that's a little bit more sophisticated, of course, but it's still a binary trade. Binary trade means it's got A, a 50-50 shot of working, and B, it only works in one direction, right? If you're gonna buy low, if you're gonna use this as your strategy, you have to have things go up. Well, guess what, guys? Stuff doesn't always go up. If you're gonna short stuff, guess what? You gotta have stuff go down. It doesn't go down, you don't make any money, right? So rather than trading direction, we're gonna trade ranges. And with options, you can pick a range. You can say this stock is trading at $20 a share right now. I don't know. I don't know where this thing is gonna go over the next 30 days. It, it, it might go up to 25, it might stay the same, it might even go down to 15, I don't know. But we can structure a trade so that as long as over the next, let's just say for example, 30 days, as long as this stays above 15 and below 25, as long as it stays within this range, we get paid, we make money, okay? So I love, and there's dozens, there's dozens of ways that we can structure that with option trades. Many of you are familiar with iron condors. That's one of the more popular ones, but it's certainly not the only way, and it's not necessarily, I would say, even the best way, but it is, a, it is an option, right? And so that's the point. Options give us options. They give us flexibility. Another example of a non-correlated account or something else that we could put our money into to give us that true diversification or asset allocation is the Forex market, the foreign currency exchange market. This is what's sometimes referred to as pairs trading or currency trading. Now, I like to use two different companies to trade with. I use IG and I use Forex.com to trade with. I will tell you that in the past, I've been very, very active, very active in the Forex markets using primarily what's called the carry trade. I'm no longer active in that and no one else really is either because there's really no carry trade in existence anymore. But one of the things real quickly that I'll just mention on Forex or foreign currency exchange, they are traded in pairs. And so you don't just trade the US dollar. You don't just trade the British pound. You would trade the British pound against the US dollar or you would trade the US dollar against the Mexican peso but they trade in pairs. Well, this tra carry trade was an amazing trade, but it's gone away now. It will come back with time. It always does, but right now it's gone away because the world's interest rates, not just the United States's, but the world's interest rates basically are what? They're zero. They're zero. The, the official interest rates in this country if you look at the Fed, is as close to zero as you can possibly get. And it's not much different in other countries. In fact, in other countries, they are sporting negative interest rates, right? Well, here's the carry trade idea. You have to trade in pairs. So you're trading one country's currency against another country's currency, right? Well, let's say, for example, that country one here had interest rates that they were paying of 5% on their treasury equivalents, right? And company, our country number two had interest rates at 1%. What you would do is you would go long, excuse, excuse me, we would go short, we would short the low paying currency. So we would sell a bunch of the low interest rate currency, and we would use the money that we got from that short sale to go long or buy the high paying currency. So basically we're selling this currency to somebody else at 1%, we're on the hook for that 1%, we're taking that money, we're reinvesting it into another currency that pays 5%. Now yes, there's fluctuations between these two countries' currencies, but the leverage, and the leverage, guys, the leverage in Forex can be 50 
to one. 50 to one, a thousand dollars. Man, that can multiply quickly, guys. That can multiply quickly. A thousand dollars, you're trading fifty thousand dollars of a currency. And so that leverage between those two can actually make what is I consider to be a very, very, very high paying savings account. And when I say high paying, I'm talking like eighty to one hundred and ten percent a year potential returns on those carry trades. Unfortunately, they're gone now because there is no more differential. Everybody's pretty much at zero on their interest rates, but they will be back. And so it's important to be prepared for that when it does happen. Okay, we're getting down to the end of the list here. Next on my list is the ability to go short the market. Okay, and we talked a little bit about the important futures and being able to hedge your account. It's also nice to be able to short the market as well. Now, this was one of the challenges that I always had as a real estate investor. When things are down in the dumps and you can buy homes for pennies on the dollar, it wasn't too hard for me as a young guy to figure out, wait a minute, stuff is so low priced right now. This was the late 80s, early 90s. Stuff is so low priced right now that you, it's below construction cost. In other words, a, a builder couldn't go build this for what it is selling for. It, it's pretty easy to understand that there's value in something like that, right? But what happens when we are in a market like today where there is an absolute mania for real estate today. What has ever taken place in this pandemic to cause this, guys, I don't know. But buyers right now in real estate, they're having to offer more than asking price. They're fighting with people because inventory is so low and demand is so high. Well, how do you invest in that environment? when you know that real estate is an all-time high. Do you feel good about buying rental properties when real estate is at an all-time high? Well, it's the same thing as in the marketplace, right? Guys, I don't know if you're aware of this because of the pandemic, but nevertheless, we're pretty much at an all-time high in the marketplace right now. How comfortable do you feel putting your hard-earned money in a place that has never, ever been more pricey more expensive than it is right now. Now listen, that doesn't mean that the market's not going higher. The market can continue to go higher. The market can become more overvalued than it is already. That doesn't mean that we're not going higher, folks. It just means that, again, if you look at a risk-reward ratio, I think we have a lot more downside in the market than we have upside. Wouldn't it be nice to have the ability to short the market? Now, once again, much like the futures, people will say, oh, Shorting the market, I've heard that that's incredibly risky. I've heard that that is incredibly complicated. Guys, you don't have to short to short. Let me say that again. You do not need to short the marketplace to short the marketplace, okay? There are all kinds of ETFs, all kinds, dozens and dozens of ETFs today that you can go purchase. You're not shorting them, you're purchasing them and they make money when certain asset classes go down, okay? The granddaddy of them all is SH. That shorts the S&P 500. So yes, if you think the market's going down, you don't have to open a margin account. You don't have to sell shares short. You can just simply purchase the SH. And as the market goes down, it goes up. As the market goes up, it goes down. It is a shorting vehicle, okay? So shorting obviously is something that all of us should have in our arsenal. And then last but certainly not least, guys, one of my favorites, uh, and that is a whole different subset to investing. It really is, as I like to say, trading as a business. And it is the zero day to expiration SPX trading. Every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, I am trading the SPX, looking to generate one or two percent a day, five percent a week, twenty percent a month, two hundred and forty percent a year annualized rates of return. It's not a guarantee. There are no guarantees, are there? But that's the potential. And the potential to make those returns is there. It's incumbent on us as individuals to do the trades correctly and manage the risk of those trades. And let's be clear, there is risk in those trades. But boy, is it an interesting business model. What an interesting business that you could be able to potentially feed your family by just sitting home pushing a few buttons every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It is my bread and butter. You guys have seen most of my videos on here. 
Leave a message or a comment here if you uh, want to learn about our trading room where we do live trade this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But I love it. I love it as a business. There's about 150 of us, very close-knit group of traders that we get together every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in a live Zoom session, in a live chat room, and do these trades. And I love the potential of it. So again, guys, just a quick overview here on the rules. No more than 10% of our portfolio in any one individual strategy. And then in addition to that, let's talk about some important diversification, not this diversification of spreading stuff around. Let's talk about this idea of employing our money in a time diversification manner, okay? Employing our money in a time diversification manner. That could be buy and hold. I've mentioned some of these dividend reinvestment plans that I have that I bought. I started buying in the 1990s, early 1990s. And uh, I'll, guys, I'll probably never sell them. I'll, 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 my kids will inherit those uh, holdings. It, it is the epitome of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has said that you know you are a good buy and hold investor if the stock market can come out tomorrow and say, listen, we're closing our doors for the next decade. We will not, none of these issues will trade for the next 10 years. And you're okay with that. That's a buy and hold investment. That's something that you feel comfortable never ever looking at the price. A lot of my things, guys, I look at the price maybe once every two years. That's, that's buy and hold, right? The next level up would be asset rebalancing, where we've done a good job of asset allocation here. We've used some of these categories. We've got our assets distributed out in a decent uh, asset allocation. And then maybe just once a year, we'll come back and we will look at those uh, account uh, strategies and those categories and we will rebalance. Now, the idea here of rebalancing is let's just say that we have four accounts. This is obviously going to be simplified, right? Because we should have at least 10 different strategies going on. But let's say that we have four accounts. And we put uh, $1,000 into each one of these separate four accounts. Well, obviously, at the end of the year, some of these are going to do better than others, right? Maybe this one does very poorly, and our $1,000 ends up being $800. This one maybe goes up to an $1,100 investment. This one maybe goes up to a $1,200 investment. Maybe this one was a home run, right? Maybe this one made 14, put us at $1,400. What we would do is we would take all of this money and we would rebalance it out so that we have equal amounts starting again for the next year. What does that do? What does that systematically force us to do? It forces us to sell out all of our winners and reposition a lot of those into the better value sector, right? So that's rebalancing, and you could do that once a year. We have 30 to 90 day trades. I have a lot of options trades. A lot of my option trades are 30 to 90 day windows. Iron condors, typically a 30 to 45 day trade, right? And then of course we have our zero day to expiration, my bread and butter trade that we are doing on a daily basis. That is the epitome of a day trade every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, right? So that's the idea, folks. That's asset allocation for a holistic portfolio. And that's why I always say, if any one individual trade that you're making loses enough money that it either damages you psychologically or fiscally, boy, you're not position sized correctly. You're not asset allocated correctly. No one individual trade should ever give you cause for consternation. If it does, you're not following a proper asset allocation. So hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Take care. We'll talk to you guys soon.